the fundamentals of his religion won't teach him to behave like this are you saying the fundamentals of islam teach them to yes. be violent that's very generalized sir it is true sir i don't think so yeah i don't think it's at all this sir if that was the case abdul kalam zakir khan mohammad siraj all these guys would be violent i also think that modern indian muslims acknowledge whatever happened and we've had people like KK Mohammed come on the show and talk about it they don't look at themselves as any different from indian hindus for every KK Mohammed i will show you at least 30 muslim clerics who come on live tv every night on debate they will say that aurangzeb is our hero mahmud of ghazni is our role model whose voice carries more weight within the larger community you know whose voice carries the most weight mohammed siraj and mohammed shami हिस्ट्री ऑफ हिंदुज इन controversial this thumbnail is if you're a non hindu consuming this podcast please watch the entire length of it because this was actually a bit of a debate rather than just a one way street in terms of conversation i have immense respect for my guest today for being able to debate with me over the course of 2 hours personally for me this podcast is a representation of a lot of conversations that are happening in our country today lots of people feel that politics has suddenly converged with the history of our country there's a lot of religious animosity in our country today unfortunately we have to be the voice of the nation i have to do my job as a media professional this is an uncomfortable conversation uh it's a respectful but uncomfortable conversation so i hope you consume the entire length of it and i hope you understand the intention behind team trs's work this is an epic conversation that i hope you'll enjoy another history deep dive on TRS this time with Sandeep Balkrishna how are you sir i'm good thanks for having me here no happy to speak yeah. with you because you dislike our history textbooks as much as i dislike <laughs> them and as much as my audiences have disliked the history that we taught in our education system mm -hmm. i literally haven't met a historian or a researcher on the show who doesn't agree with this opinion of mine <laughs> are you are you in agreement absolutely uh, interesting you mentioned that you know do you dislike history textbooks as much as you or anyone in your audience dislikes there's a reason for that but uh, just to state the blunt truth bluntly these are not history textbooks at least what have been prescribed for our school children all the way up to university even post doctor level these are not history textbooks they are propaganda material okay they are manuals for indoctrinating generations of indian children you mean putting things inside people's heads so yes. that they grow into adults who believe a certain version of history not just a certain version of history although because it is history per se it is not just one version of history the design is to create certain generations of indoctrinated children who are so indoctrinated when they become adults that any alternate view or even if the truth is stating staring at them in the face they refuse to believe it okay this has been the long term project and you have uh, at least two or three generations of kids who have now become adults including uh, people of my age and even maybe one generation before me so this has been accomplished by rigging our textbooks okay would you like to be challenged today or would you like to just open up you are wish would you like to talk about the mughal rule or would you like to talk about the present day history textbooks where we began because i think mm, that's mm, mm. kind of the base layer of everything we've spoken about mm, the history textbooks yeah like oh. you said you have a mm. problem with mm. 
how history has been written and shown to school children which i completely agree with you upon mm-hmm. on so many fronts the mm. chapters were taught about the way uh, people like alauddin khilji have been depicted in our history textbooks mm-hmm. you need a movie like that sanjay leela bansali mm-hmm. movie padmavat mm-hmm. to actually make you understand aspects of the truth about the, even the pre mughal rulers and there was hmm. too much brutality that happened yeah. which is not really mentioned in the history textbooks hmm. there i'm in full agreement with you hmm. and i think we've spoken about this on the show to vikram sampath i believe hmm. and uh, he said that there was a committee that was created in 1947 to write uh, history textbooks for our education system hmm. and people were picked very carefully for that committee so anyone who glorified people like veer savarkar and um few other names are taken which i can't remember uh were not kept as a part of that committee mm. so therefore again the education we are being taught is a representation of a few humans mm. who decided that this is the kind of education that india should get in the long history. term history the mm. kind of history that in uh, india should learn in the long term mm. the good news is that young people know this mm. not just because of the show but this is just general young consciousness because we have wikipedia now we have you go podcast now we have historians like yourself coming on the show so people are understanding the truth uh my biggest problem with this whole thing is uh nalandan takshashila was destroyed which for me hurts me the most because so much knowledge was destroyed with it mm. we don't even know what we don't know mm. in terms of the knowledge that was destroyed and it hurts when you hear stories like that library burnt for yeah. and they say one six, three months to six months or yeah. something yeah so that library burnt for six months yeah you've lost all that forever that's what hurts me the most hmm. um but what also kind of hurts me is that even our history textbooks instill a sense of self doubt and low self esteem in students when we should actually be talking about the chola dynasty the ahom dynasty hmm. other people who are part of the freedom struggle like we highlight very few freedom fighters yes there were so many freedom fighters that should be highlighted yes um we're not taught enough about the formation of pakistan we're not taught enough about general indian history even when it comes to your chandragupta maurya and ashoka uh when you're studying for a 10th standard exam in icse you're only tested upon freedom fighters and a bit of civics yeah. why not give that 10th standard syllabus a revamp mm. where we're teaching those 10th standard kids that go into the world outside school mm. knowing that you're from the country that built the chola empire mm. that built the ahom empire and all these pride instilling mm. uh pieces this was designed the way what well, i don't know what this generation reads but even when i was growing up in my school and college textbooks it was not so vicious as it is now i came i studied in a state board vicious no this distortion oh okay it's not so vicious so uh it was still still okay a state a state board history syllabus was still really okay but uh the ncert like you said icsc cbse these books were atrocious the formula was simple downplay or white wash or distort the atrocities done during the islamic period and paint hindus who resisted they were all alien regimes sir basically it was ruled by foreigners so when you talk about this you know muslim uh, back projection and all that they were all invariably they were all from drawn from foreign blood they were not indians but anyway that's a separate thing so instill a sense of contempt and by painting people who resisted hindus who resisted these atrocities paint them as rebels like who maharana pratap you think he's painted as a rebel of course he was okay I'll, I'll, again i'll tell you what maharana i know Prat- as a 1993 born person Wait. i don't look at him as a rebel so and no. actually i have pride that maharana pratap was from sure, my land but this is what uh, books our textbooks have taught us i don't think so yeah no 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 maharana pratap was a rebel against akbar i don't think it's at all this yes sir. yes no 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 yes. let's let's debate again <laughs> yes there's nothing to debate it is no my my point check is check out the history textbooks uh, from 1974 till about 2000 okay 
Just maybe, to get okay, maybe maybe your uh, Maharana Pratap from Sisodia uh, ancestry dynasty was a rebel who challenged the might of Akbar the Great. Really? These are these were the wordings. This variants is, thereof. Like this is the first time hearing this in my life because yeah. all I've heard about Maharana Pratap hmm. was about his bravery. uh about stories related to him mm. and mm. there's a certain sense of pride with all the legendary rajput kings prithvi raj Sh- chauhan sure. read those textbooks sir these are not my words okay no no fair <laughs> maybe maybe you you've seen something yeah, that i've not these seen these are not my words shivaji was a mountain rat that's those are who, the words you yeah mountain rat who dared to defy the might of uh, aurangzeb these are the words these used? are the words really when i say distortions the levels at which the distortions have been made just two examples of such great you know kings who have been painted like this why why vote bank break that down yeah vote bank if you have to tell the uh, truth about islamic authorities uh, atrocities right you will the congress party decided that if you tell those truths it will offend the current muslim community of which we are the protectors meaning we have the muslim vote bank in our hand so whitewash all those atrocities na huh? say that they were benevolent kings they brought art and culture and uh, uh, building of uh, monuments architecture they brought painting into india they were patrons of music and dance so don't play all their whitewash all their atrocities there is a wonderful book called uh, eminent historians their technology their lying their fraud which was published in 1998 by a gentleman named arun shauri he has an entire chapter which is simply a list the whole chapter is just a list of all the major distortions in history introduced by the government the title of the chapter is shuddho ashuddho meaning meaning this is the our version this is our distorted version is the shuddha version hmm. what real history tells has told so far is the ashuddho version ashuddha version these are all chapters he gives complete extracts from various textbooks in both uh, written by uh, uh, the state uh, the central government and other state governments so are you saying that in the year 2000 with the vajpai government things changed things began to change okay things began to change okay mm-hmm. and they're still changing i think there's some new education policy which i have not read in full but i believe a lot of uh, uh, you know reforms have been made in textbooks I hope history that the textbooks. new education policy doesn't instill hate in the history textbooks. So this uh, this has been the whitewashed uh, version. So how will a child become confident, have pride, like you said, in your own land, in your own culture? Very capitalistic answer here is: I feel education has gone way beyond schools and colleges. Mm-hmm. And Ronnie Screwala told me this. He was running Upgrad. Mm-hmm. He said that now education is a lifelong process, mm-hmm. and a lot of education is based on self education, self, which is a representation of what you've done as well, sir. Mm-hmm. Like you've dedicated your life to history mm-hmm. despite being like an IT professional. Mm-hmm. And I've had countless brilliant minds like yourself on the show who have similar stories. Mm-hmm. Like just out of the interest of a subject, deep dive. Mm-hmm. So even as thought leaders like yourself. or as podcasters like myself all we can do is you lead the horses to the water source mm. then it's for them to drink there will be people who will agree with you people who will agree with me there will be people who won't agree with either of us mm. and who will draw some sort of a mid midpoint conclusion but that's all we can do mm. because somewhere i don't have hopes from the traditional format of education in our country I have hopes on the new education policy, mm. but I've also heard that it's going to take twenty to thirty years for it to completely. Yeah, things like education are by design, by by its nature, they are generational. Yeah. See, so any change at that level has to, you know, the good or the bad consequences will uh, show themselves after a generation. Yeah. So that's the nature of the beast. Yeah. I hear you. 
and we've had a lot of people speak about british colonialism and you know all its negative effects on the show and i'm sure that the audience is also very aware by this point about everything wrong that the british has done i know that even the government is very aware of this okay and i totally i want to actually deep dive into exactly what uh, mohammad of ghazni and mm-hmm. uh, mohammad ghori did mm-hmm. etc we'll break it down to my historical perspective sure. after this sure but maybe as a precursor mm-hmm. i want you to address mm. the non hindus watching this podcast is it fair to say mm. that we are just talking about history as history mm. and not at all about hindu versus muslim because mm. there is communal tension in the country today mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. okay and i don't want to be a part of that mm. soup mm. in fact i want to be the reverse of that soup mm-hmm. because of what our country needs geopolitically today which mm-hmm. is unity mm-hmm. if we keep fueling this hindu muslim debate mm-hmm. more mm-hmm. uh you're actually going against what our country needs now and mm. over the next 15 to 20 years this has been the same narrative uh, that was seeded uh, about 10 years after independence that you should not talk about uncomfortable or unsavory truths of indian history because it is going to offend only one community i am not naming any community like muslims yeah if you talk about that 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 is a narrative what you said is a variant of a very very old narrative which began roughly after independence i think it's true sir yeah okay and i also i also think that modern mm. indian muslims mm. acknowledge whatever happened and we've had people like ak mohammed come on the show and talk about it mm. all the islamic invasions mm. uh they don't look at themselves as any different from indian hindus mm. they are also as indian as you and me fair enough my point is not that for every kk mohammed i will show you at least 30 uh muslim clerics who come on live tv every night on debate and it's their footage is there on youtube they will say that aurangzeb is our, our hero he is a role model they'll say mahmud of ghazni is a role model so how many kk mohammeds versus whose weight carries uh, whose voice carries more weight within the larger community we are talking about the truth right does kk mohammed's voice carry weight does uh, the late abdul kalam uh, president's carry weight or does a preacher's voice carry weight in my opinion at least see i'm not muslim hmm. this is based on all my muslim friends hmm. all the conversations i have in urban centers as well as a lot of the interior india parts that i visited okay you know voice carries the most weight mm-hmm. honestly mm-hmm. mohammad siraj and mohammad shami mm. who are the two key fast bowlers for india so no, that is fine uh, 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 ranveer the point is when you have these things sartan se juda nobody provoked that you got it so you have any number of you know uh, video clips going around uh, where all these fellows basically openly give out threats brandish swords saying that uh, you know uh, threatening to cut off the neck of the prime minister of india which hindus you know has made them speak like this nobody which brings us to the point of intent and basics all right the hindu side has always been on the defensive or they have been responders to an unnecessary provocation uh 2019 there was the vandalization and the destruction of the uh murti of durga in chandni chowk in delhi nobody provoked that no hindu provoked that so see when you talk about this communal thing and all that you have to essentially compare the fundamentals there is an extraordinary book called riots and wrongs which has documented almost all the hindu muslim riots that have occurred in india over the last nearly 300 years it is a very revealing book maybe we can have a discussion on that some other day but this is a point the hindu side has always responded the other side has always provoked we've had people on the show who will have exactly the polar opposite opinion i'll be happy to debate with them okay yeah, yeah. that's see that's a fair opinion because there's no chance that i'll be able to debate with you yeah. on this hmm. because i'm a podcast i'm the hmm. host hmm. of the show but maybe a fair argument about the whole hindu muslim thing is when hmm. there is someone from the other side talking to you hmm. 
and your scholarly material will mm. be against his scholarly material certainly we can but do that. from my standpoint after doing like more than 500 podcasts mm. i don't completely agree with you mm. because i've heard opinions from all sides then i'll give you a reading list maybe we can expand on this discussion in next episode okay okay yeah. cool fair uh, which is also why while i'm a student of history mm-hmm. uh and i totally believe that uh the invasions that happened before colonial colonialism began mm-hmm. have ruined a lot of things for our country and yes. i would also go as far as saying have killed off a lot of uh the love that hindus have for hinduism yes fair to say not love i would say especially uh, hindus throughout north northern india uh parts of what is today known as pakistan and afghanistan they were all part of india yeah i mean so no trace of uh hindu dharma survives there yeah fair you, you will not find a single temple yeah. of classical origin in the in that entire region yeah so as a student of history mm-hmm. seeing it very objectively of course it hurts me as a hindu yes you know that my own culture mm. my own ancestors have mm. gone through this yes. uh, my own ancestors were raped and pillaged etc mm. mm. uh but i have to have social responsibility as a modern mm. media professional with this kind of a following mm. so i always fear talking a little bit about the invasion this side topic, of things yeah. because mm. uh, so i mean i think you know what we are talking about how you've dedicated 30 years mm. to it mm. you've dedicated 30 years to one subject mm-hmm. which is why you talk about it with as much passion mm-hmm. uh, and i want to bring it out okay but i do a lot of other subjects as well yes i watched some of your episodes yeah. yeah so i see it from a political view point mm-hmm. i see it from a geopolitical view point where mm-hmm. we have international viewers who'll get this impression of india mm-hmm. uh, and honestly the more you talk about islamic invasions whether we like it or not it is going to fuel hindu muslim tension in this country no i won't uh, again this falls in the realm of uh, uh, received opinion uh, because unless you don't understand history if you don't know where you came from you won't know where you're going okay it's as simple as that okay it's as simple as that okay i mean i'm speaking on behalf of all the conversations i've had with mm, people mm, my age mm, mm, okay mm. uh and uh, once again i'll ask you the same question that before we move into actually breaking down the islamic invasion sure talk to the young muslim watching this podcast uh it's simple ask this young muslim to honestly read and understand the fundamentals of his own faith unaided by you know preachers or anybody just as he would study a textbook a physics textbook or something you use your logical uh, faculty read the fundamentals of his faith okay compare it with where it stands on the plane of rationality and logic and reasoning then the truth will become evident to that muslim okay i don't agree with you here but i will let you continue as simple as that yeah okay and i don't agree with you because i have not read the quran myself you should okay fair you should fair yeah uh and i don't know enough about islam because i've not grown up in an islamic family i'm mm, sure n- neither have i uh, grown up in islam which is family. why i don't yeah. think you have the right to no, fully no, this comment is, this on this is a very old uh, 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 debate which you know this is a line which is uh, one of those uh, instruments used to prevent a logical scrutiny of islam this was the same line that the church and the pope in medieval uh, europe used to prevent a rational critical scrutiny of the bible of the fundamentals of christianity both these faiths are cut from the same cloth okay maybe so the moment the moment anybody critically scrutinized christianity there what was the result stonings public beheadings uh what is known as witch burning and uh imprisoning you know how galileo was hounded why if they you know they didn't go out with swords to kill those anybody no they simply question the rational and logical basis for both the old testament and new testament the foundations of christianity look what happened okay the world has become better for that okay sir all right so who are the people who did that people from the same christian religion okay they questioned it so let the internal reform begin from there so t- each time 
Okay. Each time when the argument comes up that non-Muslims and non-Muslim uh, non-Christians, uh, because they are non-Muslims and non-Christians, they don't have a right to scrutinize, uh, uh, you know, the books of their the teachings of their religion. But it is the same teachings which impel their followers to either convert or kill the followers of. you know I, other I, other religions you, yeah and i have respect for mm, mm. the life that you have lived mm, dedicating mm. yourself to mm. studying mm. but if you and me as hindu men mm. comment on someone else's faith mm-hmm. it's the equivalent of a jewish person saying are ram ji mm. told sita to commit sati no, no, your whole it's religion not the, no no it's it's not the same uh, i think it's the it's same it's a false thing. equivalence exactly no it's a false That's equivalence what they would say about you. you no 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 now fine i'll grant you that yeah their fundamentals tell us to abuse ram and sita in the vilest terms their fundamentals tell them teach them saying that an idol has to be broken because it is against you know whatever their god or whatever uh, other things they have so are you telling me that here is a question of my survival their books tell them to do this to me and you are telling me that i shouldn't read you know my suffering is a result of those books and you are telling me not to uh, uh, read them because as a, a, a non muslim or a non christian you are not supposed to read it because you can't understand it you're not qualified it doesn't work like that sir i mean see i'll tell you what i feel mm-hmm. i don't think that anyone mm-hmm. should completely rely mm-hmm. on a book mm-hmm. as the complete compass for their life without book both these religions don't exist kitab plays a central role in their faith 100% yeah but not all muslims and christians fully listen to the book because they understand the truth about modern society this is uh, yeah to an extent i'll grant this to a good extent to you know uh, uh, christianity but not islam okay at least the muslims that i know mm. and we've had some muslim scholars on the show as well sure uh so at, at least i'm i'm not this is not white washing yeah. all muslims and all christians all over the world mm. uh and i'll also def- i'm not saying that hinduism or sanatan dharma is better than or worse than any religion mm-hmm. but in india in our culture mm. we have the freedom to debate mm. which is why even this is happening so you're actually mm. making my case for me yeah yeah no i, I 100% agree with yeah. you here that this is one beautiful thing about our mm-hmm. ancient mm-hmm. culture mm-hmm. that we are not given one book and told that this is how life is mm-hmm. which is what allows us to expand a little bit mm-hmm. but in saying that here the underlying argument is mm-hmm. address a modern day indian muslim who mm-hmm. loves india as much as you and me mm-hmm. not all islamic people all over the world all over history mm-hmm. so i personally feel mm-hmm. that um again whenever we have these hindu versus muslim conversations mm. we are not being socially responsible mm. based on the modern geopolitical truths that no, i don't India understand uh, you know these these are very very uh, general terms in this socially responsible things like that when it the question is about your survival all right mm. so why is it the responsibility of only one community to be in quotes what you call socially responsible you, why doesn't the water flow from the I'll, other I'll side i'll tell you why have yeah. you seen border hmm? and in the end of border no, the film no it's not going to movies i i i i i cinema is the worst yardstick okay, to for any debate fine. i'll tell you why sir if if we're hmm. truly talking about why it's a responsibility of hmm. hindus and hinduism hmm. because this is what we learned from yudhishthir arjun Bhim, no we didn't learn this say devan nakul no we didn't learn this i personally feel we did we learned strength we didn't learn apologetics we also didn't learn to oppress mm. people from other faiths we learned to accept mm. and we learned from the mahabharat that mm. you need to adjust hinduism mm-hmm. based on the times that you live in to an extent yes but uh, you know you're trying to connect many disjointed threads which don't 
you know which cannot make which can't come together like that okay in the fashion okay. you describe i want to give a base layer i'm yeah. not trying to win an argument against mm. you mm. i'm trying to come to a narrative before we enter the historical sure, sure. islamic invasions okay. conversation okay. so there is no me versus you here no, no, so no, definitely not okay yeah, yeah. i'm yeah, yeah. disagreements build better podcasts mm, mm. and podcasting has reached a point mm, now where mm, mm. sir if i just allow you to expand on the history that you have read mm. i'll be doing injustice to my audience which mm. has heard a lot of this on the show already mm-hmm. so i need to get fresher content mm. i need to challenge myself and you mm. to reach that fresher content sure. okay. and the audience has helped the podcast evolve mm-hmm. we have both pro modi anti modi mm. hindus non hindus watching mm. the show mm. so we have to address everyone here we mm. can't just address the hindus as i did 2 mm. years ago mm. because i was also learning all the stuff you're talking about for the first time mm-hmm. but i have a lot more perspective now mm-hmm. which is what's making me like ask you these questions okay 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 let's go on hmm so again if if you want to debate i can go on for another hour we can do that we won't expand on the historical conversation sure go ahead yeah so would you like to expand on the historical conversation you or do you sure you can steer it any which way you want just address the young indian muslim no i told you no that's my only prescription okay let him or her read the fundamentals with an open mind of his okay. own religion with an open mind see where it leads to him okay Fair. honesty is the best policy as simple as that i have no uh, you know i am not inimical to anybody what are truths or truths okay cool. uh, whether i like it or not is separate that's where my you know bias and other things come fair, in fair fair and i'm sure that there are non hindus who say the same about you also like yeah, but, but yeah let them yeah, yeah but that's, so that's, that's that is the point you keep an open mind okay don't begin with a uh, uh, with a preconceived notion before you uh, study these things okay all right so that is a uh, point what what is it that leads to violence you know this kind of thing why does it emanate from only one community and why are hindus as victims of that violence should always be accommodating should always you know to use your yudhishthir analogy adapt to these times at what cost no hindu you will not see a hindu unless he is a hardened criminal or something with the which, which is a different thing all right the fundamentals of his religion won't teach him to behave like this that so, is a point are you saying the fundamentals of islam teach them to yes. be violent yes that's why that, that's why message that's that. very generalized sir it, it is true sir if if that was the case abdul kalam zakir khan so mohammad siraj all correct, these guys would be violent correct so they no they are exceptions i know that's then it's not a generalized they are thing. exceptions i'm speaking on the strength of okay, okay. strength of what the history of islam not just in india throughout the world okay this has been the behavior pattern i think honestly there's many people who will agree with you in the world okay then i have to see what you know their scholarship is okay i personally disagree with you as a young indian and i have a different message to the young muslims then watching I, this then i'll give you my uh, reading list your yeah. reading list yeah done i'll yeah. bring a reading list from the muslim side please, also please please okay because we'll that's see, what podcast no, we'll are. see that after that uh, uh, debate we'll come we'll both okay. agree let's move on to the islamic invasions certainly i am detaching myself from the islamic invasion narrative yeah. based on the modern young indian muslims okay i segregate the two aspects okay um mm. you know i'll tell you what i personally feel that if we attach whatever happened during the islamic invasions to the modern day muslim mm-hmm. uh it's the equivalent of saying all the white people in usa were slave owners and uh, you know have affected the black community a lot which is actually what's happening in the usa today and the usa mm-hmm. is fully kind of divided as a mm-hmm. community that country is suffering i don't want the same to happen to my country because mm-hmm. for me i love being hindu mm-hmm. but i'm indian before i'm hindu okay so which is why now i will let you continue about the islamic you are an indian before a hindu 100% okay mm. yeah yeah next and, topic and i'm the most hindu hindu that i know my age okay 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 but let's go on You're islamic saying... invasions let's talk about the story okay okay mm. um why don't we begin with what happened pre islamic invasions in mm-hmm. india mm-hmm. like in terms of what was uh, the landscape the culture of all indians at that point in the subcontinent and by mm-hmm. subcontinent i also mean pakistan i also mean afghanistan why don't you draw out a cultural historical geographical map as mm-hmm. well as an economic map mm-hmm. as well as a um 
kind of blueprint about what went wrong that these invasions became successful mm-hmm. because technically the winners of war write history mm-hmm. so we were the losers of war mm-hmm. in that period if we lost war there was something that went wrong on our side mm. it's like losing a cricket game and then you go back to say that oh between overs 20 and 30 we didn't do this okay so highlight that also because mm. it's important to study history from a uh, psychological perspective so mm. that history doesn't repeat itself sure that's a lot of ground you have asked me to cover feel free wherever so b- <laughs> broadly speaking uh india had had external invasions before uh, islam uh the earliest recorded is by alexander then the hunas came in huns shakas came in pahlavis came in so multiple uh, guys came but they did not do significant damage one two they were all pre islamic invasions which means the faith called islam had not yet been born in this world okay all right uh, same geographical and the, and, the, and, the, and the greek invasions began even before christianity had begun had taken root even in the west so they didn't do uh, significant damage to us due to various factors we had extraordinary strong kingdoms and the modes of travel climate weather all those hindu kush mountains and then the karakoram pass it was very hostile territory the himalayas even today it is still our natural fortress all right so on the socio religious cultural landscape it was a rather homogeneous uh, uh, society in one sense you had different uh, uh, schools of which which were the offshoots of hindu dharma itself mainly the vaidika school and second the buddhist school and you know much later you had other uh, uh, schools like shakta shaiva vaishnava much later they came so this was roughly the uh, socio religious landscape now on the economic landscape india was the world's largest economy okay second only to china sometimes the equations would changed roughly here and there now on the political side we were characterized by you know sweeping empires under one king it could be it began with chandragupta maurya and then followed by uh, satavahanas guptas all these uh, sweeping large empires as big as some 10 european countries that was the size of one empire ruled by one monarch so this was roughly the political uh, uh, thing and uh, there was cultural unity in the sense that although we the hindu mind there was no non hindu influence in that sense by that time so the hindu mind had always had a sense of india's geographical borders and they were united culturally which is still the case today why would someone uh, you are familiar with panchang right almanac hindu calendar okay yeah. so what does it contain it contains a list of you know various festivals tithis and you know everything let's take the case of ganesh chaturthi you are in bombay so across india this festival is celebrated it's different here the importance is too much so you check out the panchang what it says on ganesh chaturthi where all is it is celebrated not just in maharashtra but across india all the famous ganesha temples on this day kaun sa utsav hoga and why it is done so this shows your cultural unity in the sense of both geography space and time time as festival indicated by a day of the festival space in different parts of india so this was always there in our psyche it is still there so why should i go to a tirth yatra in se ujjain kyun mandir nahi hai bangalore mein hai na hmm. why should i go to ujjain or why should i go to uh, rameshwaram or why should somebody staying in jalandhar come all the way till kanchipuram hmm right why should the sari for kamakhya devi temple in assam till date it goes from it is stitched in kanchipuram so which law which rule book tells you to do this which which created this system 
द पुरोहित इन पशुपतिनाथ टेम्पल इन नेपाल ही कम्स फ्रॉम साउथ कैनरा इन कर्नाटका कंपलसरी सो इफ यू नेक्स्ट टाइम यू गो देर यू स्पीक टू हिम इन कन्नड़ा यू रिप्लाई टू हिम इन कन्नड़ा सो विच सिस्टम क्रिएटेड दिस वॉट क्रिएटेड दिस सो इट इज द वॉट इज नोन एज साधना तपस्या इट इज अ लॉन्ग प्रोसेस ऑफ ट्रायल एंड एरर एंड यू नो अ प्रोफाउंड काइंड ऑफ एवोल्यूशन सो दिस वॉज द कल्चरल लैंडस्केप बैक दैन राइट पोलिटिकल हो गया कल्चरल हो गया इकोनॉमिक हो गया देन वॉट वॉज अदर थिंग समथिंग एल्स यू साइकोलॉजिकली साइकोलॉजिकल इज आई वोट यूज दैट वर्ड साइकोलॉजिकल बट दिस वॉज हाउ इट वॉज रफली स्प्रेड ओके what we also did was that i don't like to use this term but since it is fashionable now we'll use it india was the greatest ex- exporter of culture true when our businessmen went out in caravans they took hindu culture with them and wherever they went they told stories from india from jataka stories from hitopadesha from panchatantra from ramayana mahabharata vishnu purana bhagavatam wherever they went uh, even in the middle east you see you trace the history of folklore in persia turkey middle east you will find a hindu element there so this has happened more than uh, two minimum to 2000 years ago hmm. it was a continuous exchange until you know islam cut it off this this used to be there and what is known today known as southeast asia there the influence it is an extension counter of hindu culture actually speaking hmm. what made this possible unless you have this kind of political power which is also an enlightened political power you don't need swords to go out and kill and conquer and then you know impose your culture two ways to do this right one is you know chop off and then convert or you know forcibly impose your culture on an unwilling population or you do this you have your secure borders your secure your secure in a political kingdom uh, power you know how to defend your borders from both internal and external threats and then culture automatically spreads itself even china till date it hates india for a reason that you know without firing a single shot without throwing a single sword india culturally conquered china a lot of chinese medicine owes to a second century ad ayurvedic text named navanitakam so then when islam you know began to make inroads throughout the world uh, we were also kind of uh, uh, complacent in a sense like didn't take action we to defend we didn't take them too seriously okay in that sense plus we didn't actually hindu kings back then uh fail to study the real nature of this new invader so you think the invaders before uh, we before, had before. already defeated so we assume that ha this is one more ha, external ha, one invader one more external invader who was also like them okay and lot of those pre islamic invaders were assimilated into hindu society like the huns and ah uh, hunas shakas okay. uh, greeks and all that so so we also thought this was something similar to that and uh, realistically they didn't have it very easy you know islamic invaders from uh, uh, to reach uh, delhi from ghazni to delhi or from sindh to delhi uh, sindh is a starting point so when kasim comes in from kasim's raid into sindh in 17 712 and he leaves in 715 from then to establishing a firm foothold in delhi it took about 320 years why because hindus never gave up fighting hmm. they didn't have it easy unlike you know in other parts of the world so within 40 years after you know uh, muhammad died half of you no know, all of egypt was swallowed by islam and you know they had touched the borders of spain then uh, you know they were ravaging europe so okay. entire middle east was uh, uh, you know conquered by islam in within death of within 40 years of uh, prophet muhammad's death from muhammad bin qasim's uh, raid maiden raid into uh, sindh 
till the time that uh, muslims established a political foothold in delhi it took about 320 years and throughout that they met with fierce resistance at every step now think about this uh after qasim he was mohammed bin qasim was a arab muslim <clears throat> you'll also have to thoda give context on him who Oh, mm. was he where did he come from okay. and roughly what year like mm, okay so kasim came into uh, india he raided india in uh, 712 ce and he was in india for about 3 years less than 3 years then uh, he goes back to iraq baghdad M- modern day iraq mm, baghdad so baghdad at that time was uh, one of the greatest centers or one of the greatest hubs of the rapidly uh, rising uh, muslim political power in that belt that region of the world so it was also known as the global hub of uh, islamic culture at that time and it retained its uh, preeminence for about uh, uh, two or three centuries after which chinggis khan comes and then he completely devastates baghdad and later chinggis khan uh, still has uh, uh, he arouses a lot of hatred even today in the muslim world at the time when you know they thought that islam would take over the whole world this fellow comes short man with a huge army of mongols and devastates and pretty much decimates whatever uh, is territories that islam had conquered and the mongols go all the way up to egypt also that's another story and his grandson another uh, uh, mongol named hulagu khan he repeats the same thing two generations or three generations later sacks baghdad sacks baghdad again in fact uh, you know the decimation is so brutal that you know, there are graphic descriptions which i can't you know uh, repeat in this uh, show you can actually <laughs> i can okay yeah. fine uh, you know the whole city is razed forts are burned down uh men women children infants they are all uh, basically what the mongols do is that they gave the taste of what islam had done to them in a much more ferocious manner one second when did islam like when chinggis khan and uh... Ch- chinggis khan came around uh, uh, early 12th century okay yeah. and then there was hmm. few battles that the muslim world won against the mongols no before that before that in central asia islam had touched all the way till central asia okay so afghanistan and upper the chinese region which is where you still find you know this uh, uh, muslim uyghur province in china the muslims are in substantial numbers it dates back all this to this period anyway so that's why i say we have to read history sure to understand the present and future anyway so that happens and qasim he is called back to baghdad and uh, you know pretty much uh, the regime changes there in baghdad incidentally mohammed bin qasim he is deputed to invade india by his uncle and father in law okay jo chacha bolte hai na he is also his father in law and he says uh, you know you have to invade hind i'm giving you a fleet of 6000 boats you know warships and you know go that's how it begins and uh, he goes back there by, but by then the regime has changed in baghdad and his uncle has been deposed and killed uh and the hostile party the person who was deposed al hajjaj that's uh, kasim's uncle's name he that fellow is in power so kasim is recalled there he is imprisoned he is skinned alive and killed in a gruesome manner so this kind of warfare this kind of politics is unknown to india until that time this kind of you know all out warfare where there are no rules but only victory at any cost so uh, he goes back there between him and mahmud of ghazni there is a gap of about 2 and 1/2 centuries so 715 is when uh, qasim goes back to baghdad and 1000 ce is when mahmud comes into india he begins his first raid okay. so you see about 2 and 1/2 centuries of gap 
you know parallelly if we speak about what's happening in india at this time or even if we kind of precede this period roughly when was ashoka and chandragupta oh this is way back yaar yeah. ashoka they lived uh, uh, bce okay. what is known as bc you know before christ okay now it's called bce so, meaning before common era so i'm painting that whole phase mm-hmm. from chandragupta and ashoka mm. up till the point that we've reached up in our time till kasim is about uh, uh, d- 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 about 1500 years wow okay but in this whole 1500 year period hmm. um you know i mean from those this whole ashoka period we hear about kalinga war and how hmm. that hmm. war was so brutal hmm. that hmm. it changed ashoka's hmm. uh, mindset and hmm. all hmm. uh we've had someone come on the show and say that no actually that you anyway, know that's a whole other conversation about just ashoka hmm. but in this whole 1500 year period there were no civil wars in india or there weren't warring factions or anything okay so when you say civil wars it's a very good question uh, uh randy when you say civil war and fractional war or factional war a civil war what is a civil war it is the breakdown of government right basically a civil war is anarchy depending on the intensity depending on the duration it is basically anarchy the degrees might vary so this is why the existence of a government is so vital in any civilization right when government breaks down or when the government is so weak that the citizens you know uh, they take the law into their own hands and say look we don't need you that is when a civil war also happens all right now in the technical sense of the word as we understand civil war as anarchy it never existed in india in indian history really yes Okay okay fine let's rewrite it call, as state versus state wars okay so what you're talking about is this question comes from what is known as the modern democratic mind state versus state you are talking about a period of entirely composed of monarchies of rulers kings technically in a democracy there is no king there is an elected representative right he is a first among equals he becomes a pm and things like that now for this mind to understand how a monarchy operates is very very hard if not impossible okay see i'll tell you where i'm getting with yeah. this we're talking about that islamic invasion point mm. my original question was how, what went wrong in india for those invasions to become successful over time because the narratives i've got on the show mm. are that it became a little you versus me even then mm-hmm. and this is with abhijit chawda with a bunch of the other historians that we spoken about mm-hmm. there was some lack of unity say between the rajputs and uh, whoever was ruling mm-hmm. in madhya pradesh mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. maharashtra mm-hmm. or the rest of the country there was some lack of unity possibly because of this whole narrative about uh, hard men build soft times soft times build soft men and soft men build hard times mm. so where at that hard times point when we talk about india getting invaded which is preceded by soft men which mm, no 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 i don't know where you are getting this from but it like every historian on the show says uh, no no it didn't uh, work quite like that there are many reasons for this okay uh, i think i mentioned uh, about the complacency of hindu kings Yeah so soft men this is what i'm talking not about. even soft men so the man who was responsible for uh, allowing uh, kasim to succeed was a hindu king named uh, raja dahir he was ruling uh, 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 in uh, the makran coast which is makran is now in pakistan karachi uh, his his uh, capital was uh, a city named debal so this is where uh, uh, he entered Uh, all the invasions prior to kasim had taken place through the land route through the mountain passes in afghanistan you know all that and they were easily beaten back the terrain is so difficult it is so tough and you don't know uh, the invaders didn't know the lay of the land to so to speak then the weather and preparedness lot of things so they were beaten back four or six invasions uh, attempts like that were beaten back so hajaj said okay let's try the sea route this time and all the four invasions before that dahir had repulsed them so this time this fellow comes with an even better preparedness with a larger force and dahir by then has become complacent that is one factor the second factor were the buddhists 
a section of buddhists not all of them a section of buddhists who were carrying out uh, who were passing on intelligence about dahir to al hajjaj and his officers there and his spies that you know we don't want to uh, live under this fellow there is one theory that dahir was a uh, uh, was an oppressive person but that theory finds not much support in uh, through evidence but whatever this is the buddhist correspondence you know their what is known as backstabbing supplying uh, valuable intelligence it is a big factor actually it is a big factor as that in the buddhist buddhist yeah facilitated the entry yeah okay yeah by passing on information i mean okay. they didn't open the gates or whatever but they what does an invader look like you know look for he wants to know geography he wants to know the uh, troop strength of his victim he wants to know the local conditions he wants to know where they can camp all these real world things and then obviously on the military side he wants to know the vulnerabilities all right ki where are the vulnerable points uh, what is the public opinion about this king these are all you know you act on this intelligence even today that is that is what happens in diplomacy and things like that okay so uh, combined factors plus dahir's own complacency he was so foolish that he allowed mohammed bin qasim to pitch his tent 60 kilometers away or 60 miles away or quite close to his fortress who does this is a over confidence ki pehle isko yeah. haraya tha ab bhi hara sakte hai this is what i'm asking yes. like in terms of what did those soft men do mm. to no if he was a soft man that is what i'm saying if he was a soft man he wouldn't have repulsed the arabic invasions you know four times ha huh? ek over confidence aata hai ki you know i am so tough i'm so strong you know nobody can defeat me i think hard men would just be invincible to like invasions perhaps yeah perhaps but my question is what led to him becoming a soft man is it because india was so rich that it was that whole nepotism problem the rich kids can't play the game nah, as nah, well no 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 you can't use this logic here it's simply a case of complacency uh, ranveer i would still carry as complacency also as rich kid problems no okay rich kid problem is not complacency the guy who goes up you know the hard way example you know forget dahir take an example you know you grow up from the scratch you build your own life reach a certain stage of what you call invincibility and all along you see both victory and defeat but then you get to that point because your victories have been greater than your defeats and even at that point you are continuously challenged and there is a saying right you have to run twice as fast to remain okay. in the same place okay so you're used to you know dealing with difficulty and you know beating back your opponents so that breeds a certain sense of confidence in what you call as these hard men but what is the line what is the thin line that separates confidence from overconfidence you tell me no this the person who has understood that line would never know defeat no okay um maybe so breaking away from this uh, dahir king i'm also asking a more generalized question about all of a country mm. like how did so much of the country especially north india get taken over was it repeats of the same king dahir situation where there was traitors where there was a uh, say again rich kid kings mm. uh kings who had become old or complacent mm. etc mm. or was there more to it yes all of the above all all, of the all these factors came all together all of the above but they didn't come together uh, you know you have to take these things case by case okay. dahir was complacent that is one thing now uh, say in the case of uh, uh, mahmud's uh, raid of somnath right it was a very prosperous and a very strong city but it was unguarded a bunch of citizens and a few soldiers mm. were, were protecting somnath mm. that's all it was to you know it was uh, pretty much a cake walk for mahmud in that sense mm. then uh, because right in the neighborhood you had an extraordinarily powerful king called paramara bhoja in fact 
after uh, uh, mahmud demolished somnath and looted the whole you know plundered the whole place he was scared of the confederacy of uh, paramara bhoja so he had to take a desert route and uh, reach ghazni return to ghazni after a lot of hardship so what prevented the question is what allowed mahmud who or what allowed mahmud to even reach all the way till somnath in the first place bhoja was by any standard by any measure was extremely uh, powerful king compared to mahmud complacency not for the lack of strength or will negligence yeah. um and in case of mohammed the uh, gori a traitor it was a uh, it was a victory of perfidy okay and I- then uh, uh, with a lot of other things internal traitors other hindu kings lack of unity in facing a common uh, alien enemy so a lot of these factors yeah. like you said um few things one i actually want to hear little more details about mohammed of ghazni and mohammed of gori separately so we'll we'll cover those stories as well okay um secondly uh the one thing i know about history is that it repeats itself yes and i think the british knew that as well they had someone telling them that listen this country has been invaded mm. because divide and rule worked back then also so you guys should just enhance that i wouldn't quite put it that way but uh, roughly speaking in a sense yes okay yeah. like uh, there was possibly a lack of unity mm-hmm. back then mm. if all those state kings or kings from different tribes etc etc regions regions would have come together mm. maybe we would have been able to put up a fight absolutely okay no individual kings put up fight together so there is you know the clearest way to uh, explain this there is a there are two terms in our languages ek hai rashtra right dusra hai desha rashtra is what is india whole of india as one indivisible political social cultural unit okay that is rashtra rashtra is this indivisible political cultural unit called india there is desha for example maratha desha karnataka desha which is today's karnataka gurjar desha which is gujarat so kalinga desha odisha parts of that vanga desha anga like that so these are regions which were also political dominions within the larger rashtra empire em, not an empire country nation okay. okay india is a nation these are all regions which have independent kings ruling you know some parts of it what's a- uniting them? absolute uh, uh, monarchical control and so you know uh, wars are fought between them for uh, expanding the boundaries of each their respective desha and uh, so we never lost sight of that but what happened over the period is what i call the loss of the aryavarta consciousness do you think that's what united all these guys which one the aryavarta aryavarta consciousness, consciousness yes yes is what kept everyone together kept everyone together okay. so they would not interfere they recognize the suzerainty of the other king ठीक है से यू आर यू आर अ चोला मोनार्क ऑल राइट आई एम अ चाड़ुक्य मोनार्क वी हैव क्लियर बाउंड्रीज एंड द ओनली टाइम वी गो टू वॉर इज वेन यू एनक्रोच माय बाउंड्रीज और वाइस वर्सा ओके और देर इज सम काइंड ऑफ अ स्कर्मिश एंड यू नो द किंग हैज टू इंटरवीन और द अदर वे इज टू डिक्लेयर अ दिग्विजय a war of expansion territorial conquest as in there were rules related to war complete yeah, yeah hard and yeah very codified very uh, logical codified rules which related all of what we would term as akhand bharat today followed back hmm. then hmm. everyone had rules related they, they to had, war yeah. and there was a code of conduct there was a code of conduct now here is a another data point uh, uh, that will help you ex- you know understand this much better now you had different political kingdoms uh, entities uh, chola and say pallava within the same geographical unit all right during peace time i am your enemy you are my enemy all right now reliance has a plant in my kingdom 
but and he also wants to set up a plant in your kingdom he, he has to obviously take permission from me which i will grant freely so will you ki the rivalry is purely political between you and me between our armies not the rest of the society not the people uh, you know who follow different sects not the businessmen who want to carry on trade and establish factories and things like that the war is enmity is only between you and me it is political these are some of the when you think about it it made for a lot of political stability although you had you know these separate kingdoms but overall there was stability in society culture things like that now i'll take one another random example there's one businessman called kunjan ambi shetty he was uh, basically he, he his native was somewhere in kerala and he had business uh, he was running a mobile business not mobile phone but caravan type of business uh, dealing in precious metals and uh, uh, gems and uh, pearls things like that so he had extensive uh, shopping outlets uh, establishments basically in the hoysala kingdom in the sevuna kingdom or uh, yadava kingdom which is in devagiri dawlatabad there with that kingdom with the uh, uh, pandya kingdom so three or four kingdom he had free passage and all the kings out there they treated him as an honored guest because he contributed to their economy god let's go back to the let's go back to that. so this things. is the uh, sorry just digress no, no, chill, like chill, that so this was the uh, uh, state of the thing but the moment they lost this aryavarta consciousness and began squabbling with each other for no reason for very silly reasons as you know water sharing or uh, some some farmer some zamindar he set off his cows to graze into the enemy land iske liye a lot lot of you know petty reasons they began to fight with each other hmm. and uh, this factor of revenge ki mere baap ko isne mara iske bete ko main marunga hmm. so many wars were fought just like that rich kid problems rich kid problems so this kind of nonsense kept on then over the period they lost sight of this uh, aryavarta consciousness unity unity so they lost sight of this second was the disappearance of what i call you know this samrat or chakravarti so chandragupta maurya he was the first chakravarti in that sense and uh, all the way up to the gupta dynasty the end of gupta dynasty pretty much finished it off that changed our history it made india vulnerable to that extent and uh, with the fall of harshavardhana of kanya kubja kanauj that put an end to this concept of samrat like a man who single handedly rules with that you had these independent all the vassals under harshavardhana all the vassals began to declare independence and then they began to you know uh, fight with each other to expand their kingdom or sure. all kinds of reasons can we take a small pause from history yeah because it's the nature of the show yes and uh, again our viewers and listeners as much as i understand them are very modern mm, um mm. kind of in this whole polymath zone which mm. is why i'm breaking away from history and mm. history will still be the focus of our conversation mm. Mm. but this whole debate we were having before about mm. like hindu muslim unity mm. i was having it because of this reason mm. that whatever we're talking I'm about i'm coming to that has i'll uh, just put my point across uh, it will lead to that yeah like this is a version like what we are talking about is breakage of aryavarta consciousness is mm-hmm. a version of what is kind of happening today with the country where the country is becoming fragmented mm-hmm. based on religious lines mm-hmm. because i don't think mm-hmm. that um there is any difference between me as an indian hindu mm-hmm. in this country and an indian muslim mm-hmm. friend of mine who's grown up in a similar societal structure mm-hmm. so i i was born and raised in vadala mumbai mm. i have muslims who were born and raised there mm. thought process is similar love for india is similar and history repeats itself mm. so if history is truly to repeat itself mm. we are on the brink of another invasion mm. perhaps this time not by another religion 
Mm-hmm. Perhaps this time by another country. Mm-hmm. Perhaps this time by another psychology. Mm-hmm. Perhaps this time by something like another ideology, which is what's happened in America. Mm-hmm. That country is being broken down because of a lack of unity. Mm-hmm. I just don't want that to happen in my country, which is why mm-hmm. I want to promote Hindu-Muslim unity a lot mm-hmm. in the modern day. Mm-hmm. Uh, fair to say. Fair to say, except that uh, the foundation of unity. should be based on an acceptance of the past and a reconciliation and a kind of promise to see that we don't go back to those days as in you're saying the it has to be it has to be on the foundation of honesty the best example for this you can see in germany okay where throughout europe and i think if i'm not mistaken even in america generally in the west denying the holocaust is a criminal offense and germany itself has erected several monuments that narrates the complete gory details of the targeted genocide of jews for the simple reason that they were jews okay the nazis you know and they made a oath to themselves after world war 2 that this country will ensure that no ideology like nazism you know is ever born again got so what you're trying to say i think so, is the indian muslim needs to accept that yes this happened and yes, not deny it yes that's what yes, pisses you off yes no it doesn't piss me off the point is that if they keep denying this it will repeat again Okay, as in that if is they, if they yeah. think okay, see, one thing is you accept the truth and say sorry, and you know take a solemn promise not to repeat that. Nobody has a problem. One, but the, on the contrary, if you do two things, one is to deny that it ever happened. Two is to feel proud that you know our ancestors did this to you. Okay. Again, I don't think all Muslims feel proud. Of course, there's good and bad no, people in every society. No, nobody is speaking, sir. Nobody is speaking about all Muslims. So here is the thing: you and I are having this show. Yeah. Why doesn't a Muslim even think like this? I'm not saying all Muslims, but your average general person. Why can't he or she feel that you know we also owe something on these lines? Okay. we are also as equally responsible for maintaining what you call as this harmony and the social responsibility okay. i never see these voices on tv okay i never see these voices in mainstream i agree with you here that we don't hear all this too much hmm. but my, um, another way of looking at it is maybe it begins from this podcast that this message is going to go out to know, them i don't know sir i'm not a social reformer i'm not a uh, i don't have i don't speak on anybody's behalf Okay. I live a very, very uh, simple life with a few convictions. I am an engineer, so I think of a solution-oriented mindset. Okay, like yeah, rather so, than just yeah. like leaving it as it is, tension. It is. It is. Uh, it's very dangerous to speak on uh, uh, the behalf of other people. Okay. So uh, there is a thing that uh, why meditation is recommended, why these inward practices are recommended, because for the duration that you meditate. your problem will not be there for the rest of the world your problem will you not be there you are a problem there. for the world so when you withdraw inside you meaning not you i include everybody myself so for the duration that i am engaged in inward practices that i remain silent i don't cause any harm or any change to the world okay you think islam is doing that naturally there okay. enough evidence sir okay how much more do you need You? Again, we need a Muslim next to you to why not have this debate. We can. I'm not equipped to certainly. Okay, we can. Um, <laughs> again, I I do feel that so there's good the, and bad the, in every society. The whole, slightly generalized. The whole universe work works very very hard to make sure that you and I are breathing every moment. Yeah. We don't live in a vacuum. We are not born in a vacuum. So an entire creation works over time to keep us going. Okay. you know i'll tell you what i appreciate you for you do represent a section mm-hmm. of hindu thought mm-hmm. and i think these opinions should be out there like mm-hmm. we've had sikh historians mm-hmm. put out their opinion on the khalistan issue mm. and if there is anger or angst in a human's heart 
especially someone like yourself who's dedicated mm. their life to the study of a subject mm-hmm. i want to give this platform to people like yourself to put out your actual emotion in a very raw way mm-hmm. because that's the beginning of my motivation mm-hmm. which is indian unity mm. which is what i think my country needs okay which is why i'm giving you all these questions and debating okay. with you on these things but you have the complete right to express yourself mm-hmm. on the show sir mm-hmm. and while i know it's dangerous mm. all i have to say is risk hai to ishq hai mm. so <laughs> there's no danger to us from anyone except ourselves i'm telling you yeah yeah um w- would you like to go back to the timeline yeah so where had we left this thing with uh, aryavarta consciousness yeah. yeah so when they lost that you lose a certain sense of vitality and then you know all this skirmishes kept happening uh you win some you lose some but the what they had not uh, which has been i think one of the greatest failure on the hindu society community was the failure to study the core doctrines of islam it is one thing to invade not that you know wars weren't happening like i said with mutually warring hindu kings but none of them none of them destroyed temples none of them slaughtered cows none of them had this practice of taking women and children as slaves compulsory then this forced conversions so slave taking of even infants was a practice that was non existent in india until islam came mm. so you see the kind of disruption that happens social cultural disruption that happens and lot of valuable things that are lost to your civilization irretrievably so when mahmud you know plundered and you know, went on a series series of raids into india multiple times he took so many slaves men women and children so many slaves back then the world had uh, the medieval world had several lucrative slave trade markets most notably in the arabian peninsula in uh, cairo was a big slave market i think one of the cities in uh, spain or belgium that that had a that belt that was a very flourishing uh, uh, slave trade market turkey was a huge slave trade market and later lahore was also one of the world's largest slave trade markets continuously for about 400 years damn what's the period All right. yeah like for uh 400 years let's say roughly starting from why 400 even 600 years actually till uh, till till aurangzeb's time or at least till shah jahan's time predate it by 500 years or so 500 600 years and like the slaves would be Lahore. sourced from all of india all of india every war in which a, a muslim king a muslim raider or conqueror became successful would be accompanied by industrial scale slave taking men able bodied men women and children including infants okay and they would be transferred so when mahmud took so many slaves he got letters from uh, merchants slave merchants in uh, from baghdad for example they wrote to him saying that look you are single handedly destroying the market here with your oversupply of slaves from hindustan that is when you know mahmud said okay fine i won't send any more slaves so who were these slaves imagine somebody the ceo of say one of the tata group of companies imagine his wealth his net worth his lifestyle his status in the society imagine him being bound and fettered in chains and being slow, uh, sold as a commodity in a market yeah i i also this, recommend this everyone this is a disruption watch a movie called 12 years a slave have you seen this yes yes it's such a psychologically challenging movie very disturbing you understand the yeah brutal truths about slavery yeah, yeah. as well as the brutal truths about human trafficking which yeah. unfortunately happen even today even today it happens yeah but not on the scale see slavery was legal back then in all in both the in both europe and the islamic world it was legal okay even in america which is why civil war happened so anyway now this disruption this kind of thing never happened 
in wars between two hindu kings god only soldiers would fight and they had a well defined rules a code of honor a code of war ethics in which women children cannot be used as shields they cannot be used as bait in order to you know stop the enemy you cannot kill cows you cannot kill uh farmers like you know non combatants all the un charter of war and all that thing is some international consensus all these were there in existence from 5 6000 years here mm. okay let's let's talk um, about okay. the timeline again. so uh, this happened and this was a new warfare which and and think of the disruption that has occurred in one way now prior to these islamic invasions none of the alien invaders who had come had engaged in this kind of behavior so this was completely new the destruction disruption slave taking all these things right that fundamentally altered our society and the course of our history and yes you know the factors are that disunity among uh, hindu kings this i think that we have covered that ground already and uh, yeah so as the weakening the uh, of the aryavarta consciousness eventually you lose it then uh, it is as good as a free for all which is also pay, which also paved the way for uh, the long lasting mogal rule okay yeah you know what i will say though i think my generation at least i would like to believe is we are the virat kohli generation okay. which is a little bolder a little hmm. more aggressive hmm. a little more with a chase for that ultimate hmm. excellence and perfection and that's not to say that your generation is not hmm. it's just that we've been brought up with information around us mm-hmm. uh, which leads to many psychological problems hmm. overthinking is just the base level of it what do you say lack of patience lack of commitment all that's there but hmm. my hope is that all you and me can do hmm. for future indians is talk hmm. debate put out the truth uh, and do our role you know mm-hmm. we've dedicated our life to studying you study in your own way i've studied in my own way all we can do is talk mm-hmm. i don't think we should be even relying on the government to change certain things about education yeah sure i mean like it's just the responsible thing to do i guess so i don't know yeah uh, one request i have of you is i think you should go on more podcasts mm. Aye, With, okay if i have time yeah yeah we'll see. Uh, mm. i appreciate your time sir today Thank i think we are almost at the end of this conversation trust okay. me i've mm-hmm. never mm-hmm. had anyone on the show who's so easy to speak to and break down things especially when there are conflicting opinions people mm. usually bring the ego into play people bring you know their sense of what they've studied so you've gained my respect my team's respect but also the mm. audience's respect uh, there are some things you and me on a very fundamental level disagree on mm-hmm. which is the beauty of this conversation okay so i appreciate your time thank you i invite you back on the show me. sir sure um at some point i hope mm. like we can do this again we'll at some point that. in the future definitely uh again lots of respect for the work and hours and years you've put into your subject mm-hmm. lot of respect for you to come down here and talk to a 30 year old about mm. the subject <laughs> that you've given mm. my entire life span <laughs> so lots of respect and you've earned thank a lot you. of respect from thank the audience you. also thank you thanks lots so much for love, inviting sir. me i hope uh, it was fun for you it was level. very engaging thank you okay yes. lots of love sir see you soon see you so that was the conversation for today what i will request of you guys especially if this conversation appeal to you is to be slightly active on social media about trs especially when people pick up snippets and then use it to frame either sandeep sir or myself i hope that the regular listeners of the show the regular supporters of the show go on those comment sections go on social media and talk about this lengthy conversation that's the issue with social media people usually end up picking up just one sentence or two sentences from an elaborate conversation and then projecting it as an out of context opinion there's a lot of context required for these kind of conversations so i'm really hoping that we get some support from the trs community please tell me what you thought of this slightly fiery episode i'll definitely bring sandeep sir back on the show possibly to debate about other topics i just wanted to show the audiences an aspect of the kind of conversation we have in urban india today these are very important conversations for the future of our country and i hope that you keep supporting trs whether you're hindu whether you're muslim whether you're christian whether you're buddhist whether you're jain whether you're sikh 
just remember you're indian first and foremost at least according to me lots of love to you guys see you in 3 days Thank you.